and we're going to change the history of Long Island. It's open. Hey, dude. What's up, man? What's going on here? Just going over the Harrison interview. See what Uncle Harrison gave me. Alternate? Left wing news publication. Yeah, I know what it is. We're joined yeah. by, now by two guests to debate the issue. In the early 70s, they were both prominent members of the anti nuclear movement. Today, they take opposing views on the future of nuclear energy. Harvey Wasserman is with us, an independent journalist, longtime anti nuclear activist. In the early 70s, he helped found the grassroots movement against nuclear power in the U.S. and helped coin the phrase no nukes. He joins us from Ohio via DN Wood a video stream. Patrick Moore is with us. He's co founder and former leader of Greenpeace. He now serves as co-chair of the pro-nuclear, clean and safe energy coalition known as CASE. He's joining us from Boston. I guess we're uh, ready to go. Mr. Adams, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, I just looked on your blog, uh, you call yourself a, an atomic entrepreneur. I'm just wondering if you'd be able to uh, just elaborate a little bit on that. Sure. 1991, I started doing some uh, work uh, in, in classes, and by 1993, I... Uh, I left my job as an naval officer and started up a company called Adams Atomic Engines. Mm -hmm. My goal was to design and build small nuclear power plants based on a, a closed cycle gas turbine design that was derived out of a German program and also based on the U.S. Uh, Army's uh, design called the NL-1, uh, obviously with some refinements on both of those. Mm -hmm. Here on Long Island, where we had the uh, Shoreham nuclear power plant, which never, uh, to my knowledge, went online. Three Mile Island itself, Diablo Canyon in California, these reactors came in at more than 500% uh, uh, over budget. That was a large part of what persuaded people here against it. Well, there is no doubt in the world that the most expensive thing that you can do is to spend 10 or 15 years building a plant and then never operated so you never get any product out of it you never get any revenue to pay the bills uh, that is you know the infinite cost of a kilowatt hour from uh, Shoreham is the the most expensive electricity ever produced now on the other hand Shoreham was also a very expensive plant because of the unique labor situation in Long Island New York that kind of uh, area uh, not just unions, but um, let's shall we say organized uh, criminal unions. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an awful lot of uh, involvement uh, uh, with faulty contractors. You know, the same kind of guys that haul trash. And, in, uh, your area. The whole reason for the nuclear renaissance around the world The so-called nuclear renaissance, if that's, a, if that's a fair label Is energy security and climate change Does the public need re... Uh, is there a lot of misunderstandings on nuclear power? And Harvey and the, the rest of the people in my old organization of Greenpeace are stuck in the 1970s mentality Do you find, does the public need re-education, uh, re for lack of a better word, on, on the issue? The uh, reactors that would go under construction um, will be dangerous. They will be terror targets. Well, certainly the public needs to have access to information. Uh, and some of the information that uh, the public has been told about nuclear power is completely false. We have had experience with atomic reactors uh, causing cancer, leukemia, birth defects in the nearby neighborhoods where they've been built. Uh, we have 50 years of experience with atomic power, and it's all been bad. The reality is that uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, the second lowest cost electricity on the grid in the United States has been nuclear. The first lowest cost electricity is hydroelectric coming from 50-year-old dams. And it's back uh, at the taxpayer trough trying to get more money. But the nuclear uh, power that's on the grid is what allows people to talk about low-cost overnight power. 
One of the reasons I left Greenpeace is because people like Harvey spread this misinformation. On the point of taxpayers, every other country but the United States has state-owned electrical utilities. Canada, France, Britain, you name it. The, the government takes 100% of the risk on electric utilities because they are perceived as a monopoly and a national security issue in most countries. The United States is the only place where private capital is expected to pay for electricity infrastructure and the only reason wind and solar are being built is because of mandates and extremely high costs being paid to these technologies it, it's political if, if if there was no subsidy for wind and solar there'd hardly be any wind and solar I think the nuclear industry has not done a very good job of telling its own story you know America is a place of commercial uh, communication it's protected by our First Amendment and the nuclear industry has, has allowed other people to tell its story and to shape its story in a bad way. We have a you $50 think, billion you, you dollar think that if, coming down the do, line here. It's got to get out of, was, of this uh, stimulus package. Do you think that if it was too expensive, the French would have 80% of their electricity coming from nuclear? Yes, because it doesn't work in the marketplace. The French industry is national socialism. It's owned by the government. There is not the, the private money in the French industry is minuscule. The French reactors cannot compete in the marketplace. Since, We're going to have to leave it since, there. We started since, since with Patrick Moore, so we ended with Harvey Wasserman. And I want to thank you both for being with us. Patrick thank Moore, co-chair of the pro-nuclear, clean and safe energy coalition based in Boston. Harvey Wasserman. An independent journalist, well-known anti-nuclear activist. I realize I'm getting away from this a little bit, but just uh, just to get a little more uh, background on, on you, Mr. Adams, uh, where did your your interest in uh, in nuclear energy, nuclear technology, come from? Uh, were you interested in this at a young age, or did you come to be interested later on? My father was an electrical engineer for Florida Power Light Company, and I grew up uh, in South Florida. And when we used to have company picnics, we picnic under the smokestacks of oil-fired power plants. Florida Power Light was a kind of unique power company because being in Florida, they didn't burn much coal. Coal's hard to get down there. They burned a lot of oil from Venezuela. Paid $300 billion to support FARC rebels. Its members kidnap and kill. Demonstrated in cities across the country. My father talked to me about these new plants that his company was building. And we talked a lot about the fact that these plants were going to replace having to import oil. He said one of the things his friends that were uh, associated with plants were concerned about was what to do with the leftovers. He said he didn't quite understand why they were so worried because it didn't take up much space. It was pretty easy to store. And then he found out that the real reason was that they were so used to just throwing away their waste in the smokestacks that when they were told they had to actually handle the waste, it was just something they were concerned about. How did they do it? And they figured it out. I mean, they never, you know, no nuclear plants ever just, you know, left its waste go to the environment. You know, the nuclear plants keep their waste sealed up, secure, protected, monitored, inventory, you know, rather than up to smokestack. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I started early. Okay. And when I was in high school, I told my guidance counselor that I wanted to study nuclear engineering. He said, well, if you want to study nuclear engineering and you don't mind a free education, one of the best places in the world to learn about nuclear power is in the Navy. And he said, and I got some connections up at the Naval Academy. So let me introduce you to some folks. And that's where, that's where it all took off? And so that's where I went to school. I went to, went to the Naval Academy. I majored in English at the Academy. And then convinced Admiral Rickover that I had learned enough at my math and science classes to enter this program. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the, uh, the interview we did with uh, uh, Carl Grossman, the reporter, but he did mention, uh, he did mention uh, Admiral Rickover as someone who had been uh, skeptical. And he says that what we have to do in his speech is outlaw nuclear reactors. That's Hyman Rickover. That's not Greenpeace. That's not me. That's the father of the nuclear navy. Is that, is that, a, is that a true statement to your knowledge? Admiral Rickover made some statements when he was 82 years old after having served for 40 some odd years mm. as the head of Navy nuclear power. Um, I, I can't explain the statements that he made at that age. I, I do have some friends who have uh, described Admiral Rickover as not being in the greatest of health. Those statements were in the last six months of his life. 
And uh, I think it's far more instructive to take a look at his 40 some odd years worth of, of uh, safe operation and design of nuclear power plants. Some of the papers that he wrote in the 1950s when he was very prescient about the need to use fission to replace combustion of fossil fuels for important reasons like depletion of fossil fuels and for emissions. He talked about the, his worries about the buildup of things like carbon dioxide and things like that, for, you know, way before anybody else was talking about it. So mm -hmm. I think that it was kind of, uh, it's a little disingenuous for folks like Grossman to claim that Admiral Rickover was opposed or, or even uh, really concerned. Now, the one thing about Admiral Rickover that people need to understand is uh, he was a pretty vain guy in terms of believing that he was the man, he was the only one who could do what he did. Um, the program that he set up has run very successfully even though he's not been around since 1982, so it continues to do its job very well. Mm -hmm. As it turns out, Harvey Wasserman's actually hosting a gathering upstate in Beacon, New York. I sent him an email and he responded back telling me about it, so it's up to you. Beacon, New York? Yeah. That's kind of far away. I know, but what do you think? Well, you know, with the cost of gas being so high, I can't exactly take the time off of work to go plan a road trip upstate. I can't take the time off work because my rent is so high. My rent is so high because the utility rates on Long Island. The utility rates on Long Island are so high because of that goddamn plant. Let's do it. More than 30 years he's been a key architect of the movement against nuclear power and for Solartopia, a totally green power earth. There were people that weren't real happy about losing their market share as nuclear kept expanding. You know, what was the power source in France before they started building all those nuclear power plants? Who was selling the fuel? How much money did they lose when France kept building nuclear power plants?